Hello, and welcome to this bonus section for Hope Always. I'm glad you're here with me today. In this session, we're going to discuss drugs and alcohol. We'll see what the Bible has to say about both of these, and we'll also learn how they are related to depression and suicide. We'll also address head-on why drug overdose deaths have gone up exponentially over the last several decades. Let's start by examining the relationship between alcohol, drugs, and suicide. It's estimated that drug or alcohol dependence alone is associated with a 10 to 15% higher rate of suicide than in a similar non-dependent group. In my clinical experience, I believe this perhaps underestimates the correlation. Additionally, 50 to 70% of those who die by suicide are found to have drugs or alcohol in their system. Alcohol is a depressant. It's the last thing a person struggling with depression needs to be taking. Nonetheless, many folks who are depressed will self-medicate with alcohol. The problem, of course, is that although alcohol may seem to temporarily make one's problems go away, those problems tend to get worse as one uses more alcohol. Like almost all mind-altering substances, the body and the mind develop tolerance and dependence on alcohol. Additionally, alcohol lowers one's inhibitions. That's the reason why so many have drugs and alcohol in their system when they commit suicide. Which brings us to the Bible. Does the Bible have any wisdom on the topic of drugs and alcohol? Well, frankly, I haven't come across a dilemma or a situation where the Bible doesn't have wisdom to offer, period. So where's the first instance of booze in the Bible? Just like the first suicide, it may actually be on the first page. What did Adam and Eve ingest in the garden? Most would answer that they ate an apple, but there's no apple recorded in scripture. The apple probably comes from Jerome's wonderful Latin or Vulgate translation of the Bible. The word for apple and evil or malum is the same in Latin. Now, this isn't in the Bible either, but Bible scholars of old used to speculate that the fruit Adam and Eve ingested was the fruit of the vine or alcohol. When we step back and look at the whole picture and see how alcohol and suicide go hand in hand, this isn't so far-fetched a speculation. In fact, the reasons Eve was tempted are the same as the reasons so many of us are first tempted to try alcohol. Eve tried the fruit because it tasted good, because it looked good. And just think of all those liquor ads with booze swirling in the gleaming crystal glass. And because it made people think they were wise. And indeed, most drinkers I've met believe they've picked up an additional IQ point or two once they've had a few. We don't know if the fruit Adam and Eve ate was the fruit of the vine, but they certainly acted like it. They seem to have woken up afterwards ashamed, remorseful, hiding, lying, and making excuses for what they had done, just like many feel the morning after getting drunk. The next alcohol incident in the Bible, only a page or two later, is not conjecture. It occurs after Noah and his family dock their boat on terra firma. Well, Noah takes up farming and he grows grapes and he makes wine. And then one day Noah gets drunk and passes out while he's naked. Noah's son Ham in some way molests or humiliates him while he's drunk. Here, the Bible gives us our first explicit warning about losing control of ourselves by drinking. Don't get drunk. Don't get drunk around strangers. Don't get drunk around someone like Ham. And you won't know if you have a Ham lurking as your date, 
your friend, or even your family member until you too get drunk. So don't get drunk. For a number of years, I practiced medicine next to a military facility and a college, and I cannot tell you how much misery could have been prevented if parents taught their children and their children heeded the Bible's first lesson about drinking. Scripture warns repeatedly and consistently about the perils of drunkenness. Noah, Lot, Nabab, and Abihu, Nabal, Absalom, and Ammon, and many others all suffer from the consequences of excessive alcohol intake. The book of Esther is about a pagan king drunk by both his own hubris and alcohol. But when we come to the New Testament, we find that Jesus' first miracle is the making of water into wine. Jesus is even accused of being a drunk by his detractors. And at the Last Supper, Jesus offers a cup of wine as the symbol of his blood, which was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Christianity has never been the religion of teetotalers. However, it repeatedly warns about being moderate with alcohol. If someone has a family history of alcoholism or they're depressed, I'd advise that they wait to drink until they can do it with Jesus in heaven one day. What about the Bible and drugs? Again, the Bible has examples for us to learn from. Drugs show up in the scripture in two ways, drugs alone and drugs mixed with alcohol. In both cases, the results are deadly. One of the first examples of drugs in scripture can be found in the book of Genesis. We find the story of how one woman allows another to sleep with her husband so that she can obtain the drugs she wants. Now, both women were the man's wives, but there was a rivalry between them. The son that results from this sex for drugs trade is called Ishakar, which means hire or reward. In this instance, the women are Leah and Rachel, and the drug is mandrake, which is derived from the mandrake plant's roots. Often, alcohol is mentioned in the Bible along with strong drinks. Now, strong drinks are not a reference to distilled liquor. Other than one freezing method used in ancient times to increase the alcohol content of wine, distillation of alcohol did not exist in biblical times. The strong drink in scripture refers to wine mixed with mandrake or other narcotic type plants. This was the case with the wine mixed with myrrh, which Jesus refused on the cross. We get some indication of what God might think about the powerful drugs we have today from several references in the book of Revelation. For example, in Revelations 22 verses 14 through 15, we read, blessed are those who wash their robes. They'll be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. In this passage, John is describing those who may enter heaven and those who may not. Those who wash their robes, which means those who keep God's commandments, may enter, but sorcerers are among those who may not. Well, what does sorcery have to do with drugs? The Greek word translated here as sorcerers is pharmakos, from which we derive the modern word pharmacy. It refers at least in part to drugs. This and other passages seem to indicate that drugs have the power to bewitch us and to cut us off from God. Although drugs were potent in biblical times, the potency of modern synthetic drugs is astounding. The synthetic narcotic fentanyl is 50 times more powerful than heroin. Carfentanil, a newer synthetic narcotic, is five to 10,000 times more potent than heroin. 
To get that into perspective, a dose of carved fentanyl smaller than a grain of sand is lethal. A one kilogram or 2.2 pound shipment of carved fentanyl was mailed from China and intercepted by the Canadian authorities. It contained enough drug to kill every person in Canada. Think about that. You know, a standard package of sugar is about like that, and that's five pounds. Less than half of that had the capability of killing everyone in an entire country. The potency of modern drugs is frightening. They're bioweapons. That's one of the reasons the United States has seen overdose deaths go from 5,000 in 1968 to over 90,000 in 2020. This is nothing short of demonic. And just as the intervention of modern medicine covers up the true extent of our suicidal despair, our modern medicine also covers up the extent of the drug overdoses because of the widespread availability of Narcan, which reverses the drug. And without that, we'd see tens of thousands of more deaths called overdoses. Unless you're getting your drugs from a pharmacy, there's no way to tell what's in them or how powerful they are. Taking drugs that are purchased off the street is like playing Russian roulette with all of the cylinders loaded but one. I hope you have learned more about the connection between drugs and suicide. The bottom line is that mixing alcohol or drugs with depression is a fatal combination. One of the most important things you can do to help a person with a drug or drinking problem and suicidal tendencies is to get them into a recovery program and support them as they learn how to live a sober life. If you want to learn more, Hope Always has an entire chapter devoted to the link between suicide and drugs and alcohol. I have enjoyed our time together, but now it's up to you to get out and be a force for life in our culture. God bless you as you go about this.